For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. In my business, asking people to risk their lives is part of the job. But doing so, without giving them the chance to understand that there is a life after death, is something of a betrayal. The Bible says there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. As we remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, let us also remember the one that died, not just for his friends, but for his enemies. God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for you and me while we were his enemies. Jesus came to the world to rescue and save if we accept his offer of rescue, then his death buys our freedom. His sacrifice means life after death for us and peace with God for eternity. God in heaven, as we remember those who have fallen on our behalf, let us never forget the great sacrifice they have paid. And we pray too that we would be conscious of and thankful for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that offers life after death and peace with God. Can I give you a warm welcome to this our Remembrance Sunday service. It's good to have you with us. Before our call to worship, I just had uh, an intimation to make um, that for insurance purposes but not only for insurance purposes but because we believe in the power of God. The office bearers of Camille have decided to have a monthly prayer meeting in the church and the first prayer meeting will be on Remembrance Day morning, that's Wednesday the 11th of November at 10.50. Now if you know me at all you know that I encourage people to pray but I want to say that if you are in an, a vulnerable category, please do not feel any um, under any pressure to join with us. This will be a short and a simple uh, prayer meeting, and uh, we'll be having one a month. And now the call to worship. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold! The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son.
Let us pray together. Father, on this Remembrance Sunday, we do give you thanks for those who gave their lives for our freedom and for the democracy that we enjoy today. We do pray for those who still mourn the passing of those, those who gave their lives. And we give you thanks for those who continue to serve our nation in the armed forces. We pray your protection for them and that they would know your presence at work in their lives. We thank you, Lord, for your work in our lives, that you are, by your grace, our God, and we are your people, and that you are the God who wipes away every tear from our eyes. And you have appointed a time because of the finished work of Jesus Christ when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the old order of things has passed away. We thank you for his victory in the greatest battle of all, the battle with sin and death. And that the empty cross and the empty tomb are the sign of his victory. Help us not only to rejoice in that, but to experience it for ourselves. And hear us as we pray that prayer you taught us to pray, through the disciples as they prayed. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. After our next hymn, there shall be a moment of prayer and reflection and silence as we remember those who have given their lives in service.
Our reading this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians, and we'll be reading at chapter 1 from verses 10 to 24. Galatians chapter 1 verses 10 to 24. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him fifteen days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Amen, and may God add his blessing to this reading of his own most holy word.
I wonder, do you have any skeletons in your cupboard? I don't mean that literally, of course. I hope the answer to the literal question is no. But, but you know what I mean? Do you have a past? A past that you're ashamed of? Do you have memories of things you've done or said that haunt you and maybe make you blush or worse? I certainly do. And my skeletons rattle in my head regularly and I have to remind myself of the gospel and of the Lord's amazing grace. On this Remembrance Sunday we think about those who gave their lives for our freedom and those who fought but also continued to fight their own battles and demons after the war. The terrible things they had seen the awful things they had to do, the nightmares that continued to disturb their sleep for the rest of their lives. I saw a documentary about the post-traumatic stress on soldiers who had returned from the First World War and it was dreadful to see their very bodies contorted. Such was the mental trauma they had gone through that it had affected their very muscles and their coordination and that was nothing in comparison to what it did to their mental health and we recognise they gave so much for us and continue to do so in the armed forces today. The things we see, the things we do, the things we say can have long-term consequences. We can learn to live with them, but they're never far away. And some people love to throw our past mistakes and sins in our faces, don't they? As if they have none of their own. And they had rich pickings with this Apostle Paul. His cupboard is, if I can put it this way, rattling with skeletons. He had so much to be ashamed of. He had a history of deep and serious sin. And some people, as he describes them in verse 7, are using Paul's past to try and discredit him as an apostle. And I wonder, can you identify with Paul in some way? If you have experience of people dredging up your past all the time to try and make it define your present and your future. And it's a horrible thing to do, isn't it? And so the natural and understandable thing for us to do with our skeletons, and we all have skeletons in our closet, is to get a big lock and key and a series of padlocks and firmly lock them away from public scrutiny. And to live in the hope and fear that nobody ever breaks down the door and discovers them. Well, you notice the Apostle Paul doesn't do that. In fact, he does the opposite. He kicks down the door and rattles his skeletons for all to see. For what purpose? Well, first of all, to show how amazing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ actually is. That the Lord is not only able to cleanse and forgive, but he's also able to restore and redeem and use sinners cleansed by his blood for his own glory and for the blessing of his people. And in addition to that, rather than his detractors using Paul's past to destroy him, Paul, you notice in this passage, uses his past to destroy their arguments and their false understanding of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And it's amazing. Look at the way he deals with three of their main attacks on him as an apostle. First of all, Paul refutes the idea that he came to his gospel message through his own reflection or reasoning or thinking. Look at verse 11. 
He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. I suspect that many pulpits and pews are occupied with people who do think that this is how we work out the gospel message. We reflect and we reason and we think and we come up with our own ideas about what the gospel message actually is. Well, Paul refutes this completely. And he uses his own sinful and hate-filled past to do so, you notice. He speaks about his hostility to the cause of Christ, to the church of Christ in verse 13. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. This hate-filled Saul, as he was known there, would not have stopped in the middle of his persecution of the church to think how great the gospel was. Indeed, he thought he was doing the will of God as he sought to destroy Christ's church. And therein is another stark lesson for those of us who occupy pulpits. There is no way this gospel that Paul preached was manufactured in his own mind because his own mind was steeped in sin. He was steeped, if I can put it this way, in the very blood of the martyrs. His mind was steeped in hatred for the cause of this very gospel that he now preaches. And the greatest evidence of that for me was not only that he was unmoved at the stoning of the first martyr Stephen in Acts chapter 7, but actually held the coats as it were and gave approval to it all. Nothing but nothing would stop this man in his tracks and make him love this gospel by his own reasoning, by his own power, by his own intellect. No, he needed an encounter with none other than the risen Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that is exactly what happened as we read in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Look at verse 3 of Acts chapter 9. As Paul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? Lord Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Paul, or Saul, has met with and was guided and instructed and had this gospel revealed to him by the risen Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when the scales fell from his eyes, he became a capital A apostle. Now, my friends, I can't miss this opportunity to hit this point home. We will never come to know the gospel, the good news, by personal reflection or trying to work out God by ourselves and by our own means. We need these, this Jesus to open our minds to the scriptures. And we need Jesus to take the scales from our eyes and reveal the gospel to us. We need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And as the hymn says, look full on his wonderful face, and we will find that the things of earth grow, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And Paul is floodlighting grace with his using his own sinful past to do so, and so can we, Christian, 
That's what Paul does. If if you want to know grace, if you want to know grace at work in a sinner's life, look at my life, look at my past, look at what this Christ can do with all my hatred and fury. He can turn me into a Christian and take it all away. And secondly, Paul refutes the attack on his apostleship that he is simply regurgitating what he has heard from other apostles. Uh, That is what preachers of the gospel are called to do. That's what I'm called to do, to preach apostolic truth, truth from the apostles. But, But for Paul to be a capital A apostle himself, then he needed to be instructed and appointed by Christ himself. And so Paul says, you notice in verse 16, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. You notice that there were three years between Paul's conversion on the Damascus Road and his first journey to Jerusalem. Look at verses 18 and 19. And in this years, the Lord was working in his life. The Lord was preparing him for the ministry he had for him. And thirdly, Paul says that his gospel message was the same as the other apostles who praised God for what he had done through Paul. Look at verses 18 and 24. And so this message he has received directly from Christ, as had the other apostles, ties together. It's the same message. But Paul wants to do more than just defend his calling as a capital A apostle. He wants to show how amazing grace actually is. And for that we need to ask the question, who was Paul? Well, as we can see in this passage before us, he was a man with blood on his hands. And by the amazing grace and providence of God, I know that this sermon is being heard by some men who have blood on their hands too. And is there a more destructive and cruel sin? By the time Paul was arrested, if I can use that word, by the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he had much blood in his hands. Many devoted and loving followers of the Lord Jesus Christ had lost their lives, and Paul was thirsty for more. He was on his way to imprison and to wreak havoc, and Christ stopped him in his tracks, but did more than that, more than just confront him with his sins. He forgave him, and restored him, and recommissioned him. And my friends, he does the same for us when we come to him. What Paul deserved was judgment and condemnation and punishment. He deserved the sword. But indeed he received from the hands of Christ, can I say, from hands the hands of Christ stained with his own blood. He received forgiveness and acquittal and freedom to know and love and serve the Lord and others. And the the sword Paul received was not one that takes life, but one that gives life. He received the very word of God. He received the gospel. He received the Bible, which is the sword of the Spirit. And that's what God does for us too. When we meet with this Jesus on our own Damascus road, that road where we are determined to live as much sin as we want, wreaking as much havoc in our lives and others as we want 
and he meets with us, graciously meets with us. I believe he meets with us in the preaching, through the preaching and reading of his word, as we're seeking to do at this very moment. And this Jesus arrests us and floods our lives with grace. And that's what it means to really turn our eyes upon Jesus. But amazingly, Paul was not only a man with blood on his hands, he was also a man with religious deeds on his hands. He had spent his life to this point seeking to live according to Jewish customs and traditions and had excelled at it. And again, in the providence I know that the sermon is being heard by many who have religious deeds on their hands and are holding on to them for meaning and significance and salvation. And if you look at verse 14, Paul says that he's really excelled everyone in his generation at being zealous for moral righteousness, and yet it had not made him right with God. It hadn't made him a child of God. And you notice that Paul saw no inconsistency in holding his religious deeds in blood stained hands, stained with the very blood of martyrs. But now Christ had opened his eyes to the great delusion that we can work our way to heaven by keeping the rules, even religious rules. And that gives us an insight into Paul's anger at these teachers who had infiltrated the church in Galatia. And they're saying that Christ is not enough for salvation. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the religious rules. And Paul is saying, listen, I've been there. I've got the t-shirt. I could run rings round you when it comes to works righteousness, trying to please God by being more religious than the next person. And he says, it's all rubbish. <laughs> he actually uses a stronger word than that in Philippians 3.8. Read it for yourselves. And the amazing grace in Paul's life is this that despite having blood in his hands, despite the pride he had in his own religious achievements, Christ still saved him. And not only that, Christ called him into service. And not, not only that, Christ called him to be a capital A apostle. My friends, I've lost count of the number of people I have encountered who have a similar testimony. They have been steeped in sin. And then they have been steeped in the blood of Christ. And they have not only been made new, but made into, if I can put it this way, mighty weapons in the hands of the living God for the glory of God. You know, we notice that there is a cry for deep change in society these days. Many people are dissatisfied with who they are. And I think this comes from this truth, that we can only find our true selves, our true identity in this Christ, and until we find that, we are deeply dissatisfied. And that takes grace, the grace of God. And this grace is the free, unmerited favour of God, working powerfully on the mind and the heart to change them and to make us more and more like Christ. That's God's great desire for us Christians. And Paul demonstrates to us the truth of the words of the writer and preacher Tim Keller, who wrote, No one is so good 
that they don't need the grace of the gospel, nor so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Let me repeat that. No one is so good that they don't need the grace of the gospel, nor so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Paul was deeply religious, but he needed the gospel. Paul was deeply flawed, yet he could be reached with the gospel. No wonder C.S. Lewis wrote, Christianity must be from God, for who else could have thought it up? And let me draw to a close by saying something of what God was doing in the background to Paul's life. I think we may look at this a bit deeper next time. We don't have time to really explore this, but next time I preach, I think we'll look at this. But for now in this passage, we have Paul's testimony. We have Paul's story. But we also have revealed in between the lines, as it were, God's story, God's testimony, what God is doing in Paul's life. And I find this both amazing and exhilarating, indeed inspiring. Paul says a remarkable thing in verse 15. He says that God set him apart in his mother's womb and called him by his grace. Here is Paul, the great persecutor of the church, saying that God had actually set him apart as a preacher of the gospel, as a capital A apostle in his mother's womb before he was even born. Does that not blow our minds? And so we realise that God was working in Paul's life every moment of his life, even when he was in rebellion, even when he was sinning, even when he was persecuting the Lord's own people. How gracious is that? And he was working in Paul's life when Paul was steeping himself in the Old Testament scripture and excelling, he thought, as he would think, in everything religious. Paul was God was preparing Paul for the great task he was calling him to, to preach the gospel, to give us so much of the New Testament. And indeed, preparing Paul to be an example of that gospel in his very life and being. Isn't that astounding and amazing? My friends, do you think for one moment that God does not know you? Even when you're hiding in the darkness of your sin and my sin, in those dark places, in those places of rebellion and hatred, do you think God doesn't know us? He knitted us together in our mother's womb. Psalm 139, 13. And he can take all the threads of our life, even the, even the mistakes and failures, and weave them into a tapestry of a transformed life that can be lived for his glory and for the blessing of others. Let me finish in this Remembrance Sunday with a story I heard of a wee family just after the war. And the father had returned from the war and, like many of his generation who had been away for the years, was enjoying family life. So much so that his wee family became a big family. And he had grown up, the father had grown up in a beautiful and deeply religious part of the country, but no longer lived there. And like many families, money was tight after the war. And so it was suggested by the family that one of the daughters come and stay for a few weeks to help out. The weeks turned to months and the months turned to years. 
And before long, the girl was a teenager and left the idyllic place for work. She'd been brought up well, but was probably sheltered from the ways of the world. And she ended up pregnant. And with all the sin and shame of that in the community, it was suggested that she did not return, but go back to her parents, who brought her child up as one of their own. And they showered the child with more love than we can imagine, even though they were not deeply religious themselves. And in the fullness of time, this child grew up and was becoming more and more acquainted with the ways of the world even more so than his own mother, who was no longer around. And then God got a hold of him on his own Damascus road and poured grace into his life and more than that called him to be a preacher of the gospel. And in the fullness of time, this preacher was called to preach in a church in the very community his mother had been expelled from. And for the first time in his ministry that he was aware of, a young girl in the congregation who would have been about around the same age as his mother was when she left, was converted. As he preached, this young girl was converted. She found Christ in her own Damascus Road and was gloriously brought to a living faith in him. Do you see the wonder working power of God and grace? We can easily cast out sinners. Christ welcomes them. Welcomes us. Christ can not only forgive our past, he can use our past to prepare us not only for a future of fruitful service to him and helping others, but more than that, to prepare us for an eternity where he will wipe away every tear from our eyes because he has restored the years the locusts have eaten. Isn't that great? This is a gracious, restoring God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace to us in the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to enjoy this grace, to, to live in this grace, to relax and rest in this grace, and to share this good news with others. Thank you that you take away the shame and the sin of our past and present and restore the years the locusts have eaten. Be praised in our lives. Oh, for your glory we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.
the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. Blah.